Hey, 18 Summers Tribe, Jim and Jamie back with another episode. We're here with Anthony Delani. Anthony, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, this was this was an easy yes oh, to bring on. Right. Uh, why? Because, you know, when Jamie and I, years ago, we, we wrote this blog that said our 12-year-old is leaving school. He's now 20 because we just felt school was not giving the focus on the important subjects. And there were three subjects we always talk about, personal development, relationship skills, and then financial intelligence. Um, we send our kids off into the world to work for money. We never explain to them how money works in those 16 years, but you're kind of changing that with your focus. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So I, my background is I've been in the financial planning world for the past 21 years and I came into it right out of college. And uh, just like you're explaining, I, I grew up in a family, a loving family that uh, money was almost like a taboo topic. Uh, so just kind of our generation, they, uh, the money conversations were a big part of the conversation. So entering into the finance world right out of college, I, I realized just how much stuff there is that, that we have no idea about. And um, I had kind of a crash course. But over the years, I discovered um, that I just had a passion for helping families. I discovered that it's hard enough to figure out financial life just on your own. Uh, but once you start incorporating a spouse and, and kids into the picture, it just gets, uh, the analogy I like to use is like uh, a puzzle box. Uh, you've got puzzle pieces all over the place and you're just trying to figure it out. And as soon as you figure it out, life changes on you, right? Of course. <laughs> Most definitely. I was just going to, I was thinking that as you said that, I'm like a puzzle. What the heck? As soon as that puzzle's built, it falls on the floor and it recreates itself. And I'm like, what the heck just happened? So you're absolutely yeah. right. It's it's an ever evolving. And I guess that's why you recommend introducing different uh, financial concepts at different ages and stages. Yeah. So um, kind of going back to the idea of working with families, I discovered that just obviously there are all those different parts, but one of the questions that would always come up is when do I start and how do I start talking to my kids about um, you know, financial topics? And one trend uh, I saw start to pick up, especially in the past decade, as technology has just kind of gone gone haywire, is that we, we often want to teach kids the the, the uh, exciting stuff, I guess is probably the best word to use, investing and how to trade stocks and do things like that. And what I also started to notice is that there's all these apps out there and things like that, that when you place a trade, you're, you get uh, confetti that falls down from the, the top of the screen or d d bells and whistles and all these things that start to tie investing decisions with emotion. Mm -hmm. And usually emotion and money do not go well together. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Um, I said, all right, we, we need to kind of, uh, uh, obviously that's an important lesson to learn, but we really need to start focusing on the fundamentals because in reality, uh, most financial decisions, most of the key financial elements are kind of boring, the boring stuff. Uh, yeah. uh, understanding how a budget works, understanding you know uh, why we have a savings account and why we, we prepare for the, the rainy days and, and things like that. It's not fun to talk about as fun as how this stock performed, how that performed, but that's when you enter life. You don't have a, an investment portfolio. You're really just kind of starting off. And if you don't have those core principles, it, it just kind of all falls apart really quickly. Um, so I, I started to kind of talk to parents about when children are in ages seven and under, what are the things that we teach them? We teach them things like how to brush their teeth, how to do you know, eat properly, you know, eat those vegetables, and hopefully they listen. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the same thought process, if we can kind of get those the mindsets and those core lessons ingrained from a very early age, then when it does come to a point where money starts becoming part of a conversation, it's a lot easier to, to uh, be prepared, at least be aware of our emotions and our decision-making before we jump in um, uh, <clears throat> to you know, make an investment that may not be the best for us, like buying a new car or uh, mm -hmm. just, you can name it. There's all sorts of different uh, you know, examples out there. Yeah. So what would be some of the first things you teach your children about money? Cause I know like for, in our home, we don't do an allowance because, you know, Jim has a strong belief in, I don't want our children to get used to us giving them money. Like it's not mm -hmm. the world is um, mommy and daddy aren't giving you money for the rest of your life. Like you're going to learn how to make it your own. And when we contribute with chores, it's part of being a team. We all eat together. We all take care of each other together. We take care of our space and our home and our pets and we travel together and we have different opportunities that maybe other families don't. And 
And so, you know, but it's a question we get a lot about, you know, the, the younger ones, what, where do you start? Sure. So uh, to, to that exact concept, the idea of making money, something that's transactional, um, it is something that we use for transactions, but we don't want to always incorporate the idea of money being kind of this for that, uh, mm -hmm. especially within the household, because different people have different roles in a household. Mm -hmm. um, one parent might work or you know, part-time or full-time, and the other one may, may have a different structure. And um, we don't want, as you said, if you start making it transactional, then the kids, the kids are brilliant. If there's one thing I've learned very uh when uh, kids pick up on all the things that we want them not to pick up on. So if they know that you're trying to work a system or, or negotiate with them, their objective is how do I negotiate back? Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of as you were describing when and how to introduce these lessons, one thing I've learned as a parent myself, I have a 14 year old now and a 12 year old is if you tell your kids what to do, there's about a 50, 50 shot. They'll, they'll do that or they'll do the opposite. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I thought one of the best ways that I learned growing up was through storytelling. We didn't always learn from what our parents told us, but what we learned through what we experienced, whether it was it, it, it through doing things or through learning about things through experiences. And I decided uh, actually with the help of my daughter to start writing children's picture books that each taught a basic financial lesson. And the when I started writing children's picture books, I, I, I actually met with a coach and the coach shared something with me that I thought was was brilliant. She said, when you write a children's picture book, never have the parent teaching the lesson in the story. In other words, eliminate the parents from the picture. Make sure it's maybe two siblings that are experiencing something together or two best friends that are experiencing something together. Because if a child is reading a story that has a message and they see a parent is teaching that lesson, they will immediately trigger and say, no, no, I see that my mom or dad's trying to pull a fast one on me. So... A lot of times when it comes to teaching those lessons, just like you're explaining uh, with uh, not necessarily giving an allowance because it creates this kind of transaction, uh, we want to give kids ownership of their decision making. We want them to, uh, uh, we've seen them, kids at, at, as early as three and four love to act like their parents. They, they want to play grown up. They, they want to show that they can do things. So the more that we give them an opportunity to, um, express themselves and take on that role with, with guidelines involved, uh, the, the the faster they're going to learn. And the, we have to allow them to fail too. I think that's the other hard part is that sometimes we don't want them to fail because we don't want to see them suffer. But if they fail within certain constraints, it's uh, that's just it, those memories start to really uh, sink in. You think, yeah. is that one of the hardest thing for parents you're, you're seeing is, I mean, we love the the, the the failing because we know how, what the lessons are. And if there's a fake safety net, that's not how the financial world works. So we want to feel consequence. Are you, is that one of the biggest challenges you see coaching parents that, well, we want to learn this, but I can't let them fail. It's is, acceptable. is that, so is that. There are two major challenges I've seen. Uh, the first, actually my fourth book, um, Rohan and Naira and big sisters bet uh, was the result of an experience I had in my backyard with my son. We were just in the backyard throwing the football, and I said, Jason, I'll make a bet with you. For every catch we make, I'll give you a quarter, and we can keep playing until you say you want to stop. But if at any point during the game the football drops, then you lose all the money. Whoa. So for any parents that are out there, they already know where this story is going, right? They already know that fumble's coming, isn't it? Uh, but sure enough, Jason kind of set a goal in his mind. He said, oh, I want to build up enough to, to be able to buy this particular item. And we started playing and we got up to $5. Then we got up to $10 and we hit the target that he had. But as we were getting closer to that number, some other ideas started to pop in his head on bigger <laughs> things he wanted to get and, and better yeah. things. So he said, say, oh, let's just try for a few more. And we kept going. We got up to $18.50. And I paused and I said, are you sure you want another throw? He said, let's just try one more. And of course, it's always the one more that, that, that gets you through the ball to him. And sure enough, he fumbled. But the reason it was such a memorable experience is after he fumbled the ball, he didn't get mad at me. He basically just stared there at the ball for a second and reflected on the moment. He realized it was his decision. He allowed greed to get the better of him. He, yeah. he failed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate to use the word failure because that's a negative kind of association. But the idea is that he had a moment where he realized 
I allowed my emotions to prevent me from you know, capturing all that, from achieving the goal that I originally set for myself. And I said, you know, you're never going to forget this memory. So we're getting this into a book. We're going to, this is one of those core memories that's going to be hanging around forever. So I, I do think just kind of, it's a simple example. No one was harmed in the experience. I mean, he lost some money, I guess, is, is the most harm that existed, but a great family bonding kind of lesson that didn't involve judgment, didn't involve anything that um, uh, really caused harm. And I mentioned there are two items. So one is fear of kind of how you approach your kids. I think that, or when to introduce these ideas of, you know, testing and failure and things like that. The biggest issue I've seen with adults and children throughout, um, and really with adults who are looking to take control of their own financial lives is fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. There's so many other small mistakes we can make here and there, but fear of judgment is the number one thing that, prevents people from actually taking that next step. Um, and that's fear of judgment from self, that's from spouse, that's from uh, you know, community, from even a financial advisor. If you meet with a financial advisor, I've had an individual say, please don't judge me for this decision I made 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. like, if you think your financial advisor is going to judge you, you should fire them on the spot. They're, they're there to help you, not to uh, uh, influence your decision making uh, or to you know ridicule your decision making. Uh. Um, and I go back to that example with my son, Jason. After he fumbled the ball, I could have said, I could have kind of used that as dad on his high horse saying, oh, see, if you had just uh, you know, uh, you know, had control of your emotions, you would have made a much better decision. And you really just need to, I could have been preachy toward him. But instead, I allowed him to quietly reflect, think about the moment, and then tell me how he was feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of a key piece with kids is, especially when it comes to decisions on grown-up decisions on money and things like that, not only allowing them to try things and make mistakes, but also being very mindful of how we approach them after that mistake is made. Are we going to judge them or make them feel judged, even if we don't intend to? Mm -hmm. um, or are we going to kind of give them a chance to express what's going through their minds and how they're feeling? Uh, that, that's a big thing. If we can get that fear of judgment out of the picture from the beginning, then as they st do start entering decision-making later in life, they're more confident. They're not worried. They're not allowing emotion to creep in to the decision-making that they have. We have uh, five children, two are adults now, and they both have started multiple businesses and they've had multiple fails. They've uh, purchased their own vehicles and sometimes it's been lemons and they have to handle the financial repercussions of it or the repairs. And and it is very difficult every time, but one thing that we remind them of, you know, like, it's great that you're at home. Now is the time to fail. Like try all the things and fail while you're here, you know, and you have, and then even our oldest who is just um, getting into his own home and he put all of his savings as the down payment. And he's like, oh, I have no money now. I'm like, well, just a reminder, you do make money every single week, which is how you saved money. But I said, but you have parents and we can talk these things through. And if you end up in a something, you know, and so I think we've always kept a really open door on communicating when we have financial highs or lows, like, Hey guys, this is what we just went through. We usually, uh, have meet with the, our oldest, um, they're 18 and 20 now, but since they were maybe 12, you know, 12 and 14, something like that weekly, and we kind and they've sat in our accounting meetings, our CFO meetings, and we talk about things like, you know, this is a harder year than, you know, we're in real estate as well. And the rates are higher. So the sales are lower, whatever it may be. And um, these are real things. And so they see us as real people as well, because the last thing I would ever want is for them to think, well, mom and dad always did it great and did it right. And they always had what they needed. I can't share my struggles. So what do you think about kind of sharing the good, the bad and the ugly? Um, I think I heard it best. I can't say that I coined this phrase, but uh, we, we we learn through failure. We don't necessarily learn through success. Uh, when, when something's going well, when everything seems rosy, uh, we, we don't really, the, the memories don't sink in. It, it's kind of just, oh, it's happening. I'm good. And, and, and things pass. But when you have those moments of, uh, and I think it's wonderful that you do share, like you said, with your child, the, the ups and downs, because once again, if they know that you are real people and that parents can struggle as much as children do, 
they're they're not only learning about how you struggle. It's not so much that you're struggling. Every you know, we, parents go through all sorts of different things. It's how are you reacting to that struggle? Are you kind of approaching it, saying we need to? Ex we're acknowledging it. We're going to take steps to address it, or we're going to start yelling and getting mad, and uh, we're not even going to talk to each other for the next in the next six weeks. Um, and and don't get me wrong, as as a parent, you know, emotions uh, we we can't control them all the time. But it, it the more kids can see you you going through those stages of life and dealing with the ups and downs and uh, approaching it in a collected manner, the the more that they're gonna just just like watching you brush your teeth every every day, they're, they're going to kind of say, okay, this is how it's done, and this is how I'm gonna approach things moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of psychology that that goes into those initial years of life and. Uh, even as teenagers, um, they are really paying attention, and that they will they will hone into your best and your worst traits. Like just probably the best way to say it. Well, and switch, switching gears a little bit, but it leads into this. A lot of kids are not taught this. They go out into the real world. They struggle with money. They find someone that they fall in love with, and they get married. Then the financial issues can really start to multiply at least from what we've seen in some family coaching that we've done. I know you also do a series on young couples and the, the stats I've seen is that the number one reason for divorce is financial issues. That's the number one reason. Are you seeing that getting better or worse? And is, is this what we're talking about right here where they don't, you said, share the failures. That's great. You're doing with that kids. We found couples where, one of the spouse members, they had no idea what was going on that there was a financial problem. And so there's this pressure, this guilt, this secretiveness. You know, what are you seeing on that side of young couples um, and the problems that they're having? So it, it does lead back to the idea of fear of judgment um, uh, being the leading cause that could prevent individuals from even, even addressing the problem. Because if you're not even willing to talk about it, oftentimes when we're afraid one of the first things we do is we separate from the relationships in our life. We don't want to uh, cause harm to those we love. We don't want to uh, uh, you know, be ridiculed by those we love. And so we, we don't share what's going on with our children uh, when, when things are struggling. We don't share what's going on with our spouse when, when things are struggling. Um, I can share the, the two of you that the foundation of Owning the Dash, which is what all of these books are under. My first book was called Owning the Dash. And it's a bit of a sad story. Um, uh, I had a cousin, his name was Greg Plitt, uh, P-L-I-T-T, -T, and Greg was really famous in the fitness world. He was on the cover of over 250 fitness magazines, and just, you looked at his body and looked at mine, you wouldn't believe we were cousins, but that's a different story. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Greg passed away uh, unexpectedly back in 2015, and um, while he was alive, he, even before, before vlogging was a thing, he would do, uh, members and fans would email in questions on life and fitness, and he would answer those questions. So to try to really remember my cousin, I would watch those videos. And as I was watching them, I realized a lot of his philosophies as they relate to fitness could also apply to finance. And why that was really important to your question on young couples and young individuals is that sometimes it's hard to relate to the young individuals on topics they don't understand, because as you said, they, they may have never been introduced to money before. Yeah. But there are other things that that young individuals can understand, and fitness is one of them. You know, it seems that young individuals are a lot more attuned to fitness goals than than we were back in the day. Um, and so I realized that a lot of my cousin Greg's philosophies, as they relate to fitness, could also apply to the world of finance, which is what created the original Owning the Dash book. And the title is a little bit odd, uh, but the reason for the title is one of Greg's videos was actually on the concept of debt and uh, the idea of uh owning the dash which is on your tombstone between your birth and death dates you have this dash in between and just this little period of time where you get to really take ownership of your life and the sooner you can do that and recognize that um the more powerful it can be so it just it hit me hard it wasn't the best title for a finance book because nobody mm -hmm. had any idea that owning the dash and finance work together but um i think that to to the question on really focusing on young adults and even those uh, high schoolers and college uh, age students is um, they, they get snippets of information. They, they, uh, their world is the, the social media, I'm going to just flash information at you as quickly as possible. 
Um, and I think it's a lot harder because the informa when information is presented in that fashion, it's it, it has to have kind of a um, a shock value or a uh, uh, I, I hate to use this word, but like a, a sexiness to it or a you know something to draw you in. Mm -hmm. And usually the advice that you get on a lot of these snippets of infra of financial advice are are maybe not the best things you should be considering. It's it's the boring stuff that that really they should be focusing on, and instead they're getting all these little uh tidbits of unique advice yeah. I, don't, um, I don't think i ever remember shock when it comes to like a wise investment sexiness and shock value being two things that have been a, a good thing when you when you look back on it so that is that is a scary point that i've never really thought of well it, it, we're, i mean it's emotion they're trying to drive your emotion into buying this product or investing in this uh, platform or whatever it might be and um, that that's really the hard part for, for those young individuals. It's a, they're too afraid because they don't want to be judged to ask for advice, either from their parents or from an advisor. Um, they don't feel that they, they qualify to be able to, to, to ask for help. Um, and the places they're getting their information from is, is it's not uh, comprehensive. It's just little snippets. So I think to an extent, yes, it's much harder um, I, I'll go back to the fitness analogy. There are so many fitness apps out there now today compared to 20 years ago. Is the society in much better shape today than they were 20 years ago? No, <laughs> the app is not the tool. Just because you have the tool, just like money to the very first point you made, money is just a tool to achieve something. But if you don't have a purpose or an understanding of it, then it, it, it can get, it can become, it calls just as much harm as it does good. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I think that that's part of the reason that I'm trying to introduce these books and uh, the conversations like this are the essential piece where you know, maybe parents are having a little second thought on how I'm approaching this con or if I'm going to approach this conversation with my children or you know, you know, even the neighborhood community kids. <laughs> yeah. And now I just wonder, you know, you made such a great point earlier in, about emotion and money and and about the little confetti on the screen. And it got me thinking about that that connection between dopamine and money, you know, is really what I hear you saying when you say, you know, this congratulations or you're awesome or fun noises, or you get to the next level. And they have games apps for children where they do certain things and then they earn money. And, you know, I, I do feel like one, the dopamine connection is, is so interesting because you know, money and emotion are just that, like I, you said it so well, I, I just feel like I had an aha thinking dopamine and money, those things do not mix everything. It's kind of like food. We had to get to that point of being like, food is not entertaining. Yeah. You know what I mean? Money is not mm -hmm. entertainment. Food is not entertainment. This is like necessity types of things. Um, but I think where I'm going with this is just um, the idea of, you know, we, we don't see our money move anymore. We don't have dollars. We don't go to the groceries. I order all of our groceries. We've got five children. I don't want to take everyone to the grocery store. I don't even want to take my husband to the grocery store. It's not fun anymore. It's like, and so we're losing some of this visual transaction by not having paper money, by having, you know, and it honestly, it's a dopamine hit for me. I order my stuff on the way to church. He's driving. Boom, it's done. I'm super mom. I'm going to church. I'm hanging out with my people. I don't have to go to the grocery store. I'm helping someone else with a job. So I'm trying to figure out how to, how do these books and, and tell me about your concepts just reining in all of these pieces that kind of feel good or are disconnected from what it really is. So the first book, that uh, that came to life. I was actually uh, in the process. It was right when COVID started. Um, I was in the process of writing my second adult financial self help book for um, the the individuals getting closer to retirement. And um, I would write during the evening hours after everyone went to, went to sleep. And for all the other parents of teenagers out there, if if you have a teenager, you might have that teenager that never sleeps. Uh, and sure enough, my daughter Abby was what was that teenager? I would be writing, and all of a sudden, I looked to my side, and there. I hear, hi, daddy. And uh, <laughs> we started writing next to each other. And we came up mm. with the idea of oh, writing wow. a children's picture book. So it was That's it was good. very exciting to have kind of that bonding experience. Um, and of course, my, my, my son helped out with saying, dad, that rhyme will never work. That sounds terrible. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the first story that we that we came up with um, in, was called Dash and Nikki and the Jellybean Game. 
And the idea behind that story was a brother and sister, no parents, uh, a brother and sister wake up and there's a letter waiting for them and it invites them to play the jelly bean game where they go downstairs and there's two plates that each have 10 jelly beans and uh, there's a jar full of jelly beans in the center. And the note says, basically welcome to the jelly bean game. For every hour that you can resist and there's still 10 jelly beans on the plate, you'll get five more. And the some parents may automatically be thinking about that sounds like the marshmallow study for, from years back. Are you too familiar with the marshmallow study? Yes. I am. Yeah. Yes. So I love the fact that our, our, a lot of in, our generation is, uh, but for those that don't know, it's basically they put children in a room, uh, gave them a marshmallow, said, I'll be back in a few minutes. If the marshmallow is still there, uh, you can have another marshmallow. And they studied to see how the kids would behave. So in this case, we have jelly beans. Um, and uh, th the first thing I'll point out is that with this story, I, there's no money involved in this story because children at a young age can't earn money so they can't appreciate money. Mm. But most kids can appreciate candy. And maybe that's not the best example no, to use, but uh, they value, they can understand the more candy I have, the better. So in this story, what happens is one sibling is Dash, the older brother who, might, who looks just like my son, Jason. Uh, he uh, says, I'm gonna win this game. And he's got the 10 jelly beans there. He takes another plate and puts, his, puts a plate on top of his jelly beans so he can't see them anymore. Mm. Whereas Nikki looks at the jelly beans and after about two minutes says, um, I have a little impulse, a little emotion kicks in and, and the jelly beans are gone. <laughs> so as the day progresses, Dash's jelly bean pile grows and grows and Nikki's plate stays empty. And D Dash can see his sister basically getting really upset and, and, and seeing the, the struggle. Um, and if that was the end of the story, that would be terrible. But <laughs> it, it, there's a little twist that happens where Dash decides hey, I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to help out my sister. Uh, and he says, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, he says, Nikki, I'll give you 10 jelly beans if you, if you promise to give me 12 back, knowing that she's going to get a lot more than 12 throughout the rest of the day. So they make the deal and it all works out well. They both end up winning the game. But the things that we see in the story are number one, it's a brother and sister going through these emotions throughout and kind of, we can see the emotions play out where children should hopefully be able to connect. To, to those kind of you know, what's what the these characters are experiencing. Um, but we also get to see the compounding effect. We, we, we learn these basic financial lessons without even talking about money, how the the, com the compound interest with, with the, all the jelly beans growing on the plate, covering up the plate, covering up the money. Uh, if money's sitting in a checking account, it always seems to go somewhere. But if we put it somewhere and give it a purpose and hide it from ourselves, then the psychology doesn't start to kick in. So I think that the, kind of going back to your point, the, the question is, how do we introduce these lessons? We can introduce financial lessons in all sorts of ways that don't have anything to do with money. And when money starts to become a picture, when they do start earning it, or if there are, is an allowance, um, there are ways that you can allow the children to have ownership of that money. And one of the best examples I've used with my, with, with my children is my son is the hoarder in the family. He will hoard, hold on to money as long as he can. Um, and whereas my daughter is more giving, which is why we have kind of Dash and Nikki. Uh, mm -hmm. it, J Jason, every time we go to the gas station, we'll go to that front aisle with all the candy on the shelf and say, oh, dad, will you please get me this? Will you please get me that? So I started to say one day, you can, if I thought it was appropriate, you can get this, but you have to pay for 50% of it. You have to pay for 75% of it. And then all of a sudden, he has his own money. He has to think about the math. He has to try to you know, figure out how much he has. Does he have the money to do that? And is it worth it? And I will tell you for all the parents who deal with that struggle, you'd be amazed how that conversation just gets shut down right on that spot. So <laughs> gives them a whole different perspective. It right? does. And their ownership, I think, is the key part. Yeah. We call it skin in the game. Skin Perfect. in the game really does change it from just imaginary to more real. That's for sure. Well, Jason, I'm I'm sorry, uh, Anthony. You look like a, a friend of mine, Jason. So the son's Jason. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and he looks like a oh, good friend, Jason. <laughs> so, how can people get a um, best in touch with you? How can they, you know, pick up your award-winning series? You know, whether it's for their children or if they're a young couple starting out, where can they get that? So everything is available at owningthedash.com. O W N I N G the dash D A S H dot com. Um, these books uh, are, there's a section on the website that uh, is called for educators. These books are actually, unfortunately, ending up in a lot of schools, elementary schools. 
Uh, but on that for educators, uh, there is a section that offers free PDF of discussion questions to talk about with right. the kids on the books, as well yeah. as games and activities uh, that parents or teachers can use. Um, the only thing you'll need to open up all those attachments is a password. And that password for, for your listeners is owning my dash exclamation point with a oh, capital O, capital gosh. M, capital D. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes for everyone because I'm interested. I We love questions. Mm -hmm. Questions are one of our big things for our date night, for lots of things. So if you're giving them for young couples and for children, that's fantastic. We'll check it out. I encourage everyone else to check it out. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. It's great to hear the inspiration behind it. it was a, 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 a springboard from a tough situation with your cousin and for good cause and with your own children involved. We love this. It's needed more. And so just appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you both for today. It's It's been a blast. And uh, I, I just, I got to say real quick, I love the dynamic the two of you have. It is beyond um, awesome. So oh, keep it up. I'll keep them. <laughs> for now. Great. Oh, thanks so much, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you.